today we have with us uh, Ed Bear, who's the newly minted CEO, to tell us about the company. Ed. Good morning. Um, I'm going to take you through our presentation and then address some comments which relate to the latest developments of the company's entertaining. And then I'd be more than happy to uh, take on questions and answers from anybody. So to start, really what we're trying to do at Honey Badger going forward is to become a premier silver focus growth company. Um, you all know cautionary statements and you can read them at your leisure and refer to them. But Honey Badger's key investment drivers as we're building the company up, we're gonna be focused on value creation and specifically looking to grow organically through our main properties in Thunder Bay and look for strategic acquisitions that are, will continue to be accretive to, accretive to the company. Um, our significant value, as we define it, is really leveraging the company's expansive asset in a past-producing, past unexplored Thunder Bay Silver District. Um, we've identified um, potentially accretive acquisitions, which I will be addressing at the end of the presentation. Um, but everything that we're looking at is basically based on high-grade quality ounces. Um, we're obviously mindful of jurisdictions, and we will focus on the ones that we deem to be most mining friendly and ones where we have experience working in. This new team that we've kind of brought forth is really has an extensive record of value creation. Um, and what we really pride ourselves in is our ability to um, leverage our relationships, existing relationships, long tenured relationships, in my case, some date back as much as 30 years. And really our forte as a group and collectively is our extensive experience working in the Americas, certainly countries like Brazil, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Mexico have been uh, very good to us in the past. Um, we know a lot of people in those areas, uh, people that are currently working in some very exciting uh, projects and prospects, and as well as new ones that uh, we're aware of through uh, private endeavors. So we will be addressing some of that. We'll be looking at some of those. And as the presentation goes, we will focus basically on our Thunder Bay properties, as well as some of the work that we want to do outside of uh, Canada. Um, just to uh, give you a brief outlook on our capital structure, our share price currently resides around $0.07. Cents. Uh, we know that we have uh, 92.9 million shares outstanding. Uh, there are some options that have been issued, some in the money, some are not. Same thing with warrants. Um, fully diluted, if everything would take place to our liking and the share price would perform, we would have 128.3 million shares. Our current market cap is really not indicative of basically some of the things that we do have on hand. For example, we have a 5.7% stake in Blue Thunder listed on uh, the TSX Venture. They're currently exploring in Quebec and quite successfully at that based on initial uh, release from the company um, that you may want to refer to. And also, uh, we do have some cash on hand that allows us to make some decisions um, that are currently in place. We will, as you can imagine, and, and as any junior company would actually entertain, look at uh, raising some monies along the way. But we will do so when we feel it's the right time, number one, and number two, for the right possibilities. We understand that we're taking on third parties' money, and it's our responsibility when you're dealing with other people's money to allocate the money accordingly, and we will do it responsibly. So please uh, stay attuned. Um, but we will be uh, looking at projects that will be very much and very well deserving of, of your monies. Um, the team, just so um, you get an understanding of who we are, Chad Williams, I imagine a lot of you would know, um, certainly uh, chairman of Red Cloud uh, that put on this great event for us. Um, and also myself, as you see, as number two, and then Chad uh, Gil Fillon, who's also with uh, Red Cloud. Some of you, I'm sure, know, and his background is very impressive. Um, Fiona is our CFO. Ed Thoreau is our VP of Corporate Development. He also does extensive work uh, with Blue Thunder, um, so he lends his time to both companies as well. We have uh, Pat, who um, does serve in a community engagement and First Nations role, um, certainly important in working in, in Ontario and in Quebec. And we've kept kind of a very strong relationship as our technical advisory team remains um, with Quentin Chiari and Jean-Francois, both who uh, were in part of previous management. And they will be certainly instrumental in our decision-making process, especially as it pertains to Thunder Bay. Um, why do we want to focus mainly on silver or primarily on silver? Is really no mystery other than our belief, and our strong belief, I thought, that silver continues to be... Uh, maybe not as greatly appreciated as gold in this latest cycle. Um, we certainly believe that um, silver is um, correlated 
in the same ways for some people um, as gold is in terms of the, its historical performance. Um, certainly when precious metals rise, um, you know, due to macroeconomic concerns and market volatility, silver tends to sooner or later take a run. And we believe that the current move that silver has experienced hasn't really been fully valued and fully realized. And we believe going forward over the next 12 to 18 months or even greater, that will perform. Uh, please keep in mind that we, as uh, management of the company, it is not our role really to address commodity cycles, nor do we really kind of focus on the performance of any particular commodity. But we do have from time to time beliefs that we want to entertain that will lead us to making the right decision on any acquisition or any undertaking that we pursue. Um, so, again, just uh, one chart that we referred to internally that we thought we could share with you is the changes in annual silver mine supply. Uh, and they are as negative of, as it's ever been. And, and that's really kind of our main attraction right now. I don't know if some of you may have seen uh, First Majestic, a company that we have great respect for. Um, Keith Newmeyer, their CEO, came up with a very interesting comment, which I'll quote, which says, um, you know, silver is rarer than uh, people think, with miners producing only eight ounces of silver for every ounce of gold. And I don't know if that, a lot of people realize that. And because it is crucial uh, to much of manufacturing and silver's potential for price appreciation, it is really substantially greater than gold's. Um, so sooner or later, that has to be translated into the market. And again, it is Honey Badger's belief that um, that will happen in the very near term. And we want to be part of that. So why is Thunder Bay and why the Thunder Bay Silver District and why, you know, as new management, you always have the, the belief that you come in with a new broom and you can sweep clean any past mistakes or any past undertakings and take it upon yourself to to drive a new process. And I would like to just kind of address something on a personal note. I've been in these situations before when I've taken on companies. Um, I'll mention, you know, when I stepped into TVX Gold in the 90s, when I turned around Greystar Resources in the early 2000s, and then when I... Um, you know, took on a very significant challenge of turning around a company called European Goldfields, uh, which assets uh, are now residing in El Dorado Gold. But in any of the endeavors that I've undertaken previously, you know, certainly coming in to, a, to somebody else's management team or trying to be able to um, undertake a new change in a company and restructure it, if it may be, um, you have to take on into consideration what exactly is in the portfolio and be able to analyze and understand what it is within that portfolio. So I've taken the last four weeks um, to seriously sit down and look at Thunder Bay in earnest. And I knew some of the history, but I am now more than ever fascinated by its historic high grade silver production. Um, I knew the numbers were high, but they remain extremely high. And I think that's really what we wanna try and pursue. We wanna introduce a new thesis in Thunder Bay of a, a discovery um, in keeping with what previous miners, you know, basically put their lives on the line for, which is really looking for silver, you know, in, in bonanza type veins. Um, this dates back to the 1840s, as we are, we're now very well aware of. Uh, the cutoff grades that were used were, you know, enormous in size in today's world, uh, 1,000 grams per ton silver. And the production was very, very significant, but also the, the remnants are just as significant. And that's really what we want to pursue. We want to go back to this mine and I'll let you all read, you know, the information that we've posted for you on this slide. Uh, certainly the, the, the position that we have is the dominant position in, in the historic district of Thunder Bay. Um, we've looked at a lot of claims. You know, we have significant more claims. We have 37,000 at one point as Honey Badger. And those numbers have now been uh, basically concentrated within 16,800. And the reason that some of those claims are no longer within is because they didn't really serve the thesis that we are pursuing now. And this thesis is really to overlie nine paths uh, producing high-grade mines and silver mines. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, I had to take a sip. I'm trying to get over this really bad cold. Not COVID, just a cold. <clears throat> Um, overlying nine past producing high grade silver mines with um, historic, again, production that we cannot be dismissive of. On the contrary, I think we were encouraged um, by the work that was previously done that we can actually take on and fulfill, if you will, the greater dreams of our predecessors uh, in the area. We know that, um, you know, we, we benefit from the easy access year round through highways and access roads that are currently in and around the properties. Be it the Beaver property, as you see on the map, you see all those stars that are there. Those are really historic silver mines, and those are the primary targets that we're going to be going back uh, and taking a very hard look at. 
you know, this is an established mining region. Um, so all the infrastructure would be in place, as you can imagine. Um, the, you know, this exploration thesis that we're going to pursue is really led by focusing on two main structural corridors that are associated with, again, the past producing silver mineralization that was identified. Now, sometimes people go back to historic sites expecting the same grades or, you know, to maybe look over an area and the expectations of bonanza grades. I think in this case, um, we will, we're going to challenge ourselves to prove that that is really the case, that we're really going to be able to go to these historic silver mines and look at these, you know, go through the shafts, go through the remnants and really give this a very hard look, certainly focusing within the Beaver property first. And we'll, we'll address that in a minute. And we're going to be looking, you know, in an area that's 160 kilometers. So it's going to take us a little time. And we, you know, we ask for your indulgence and your patience from the outset but we will give this a very, very thorough and hard look uh, under this current management. So what really we're gonna try and do is untap potential. I think that's really no secret. Um, we're gonna be looking at, uh, you know, <coughs> historically developed uh, areas. Uh, we wanna look at the host rocks in earnest. Um, they, they were never systematically sampled. And I think that's really important to note. Um, there's Significant extensions at depth um, for other polymetallic uh, metal, you know, metals that we have to consider, including gold, zinc, and lead, um, and possibly some cobalt as well alongside. Uh, not too dissimilar to what you would find, for example, in the cobalt district in Cobalt, Ontario. Um, but nevertheless, the Beaver Silver property covers some of the most productive silver-bearing veins um, of what we term the Rabbit Mountain deposit. So, as as indicated. We will definitely take our time and we will look at this and look at it thoroughly. Um, a little more, a little more information on Beaver Silver. Um, the mine was the largest, second largest producer in the district. Um, and, you know, it's 100 percent ownership of sur on surrounding contiguous unpatented claims, about 4,300 hectares. Um, there's four historic silver mines within that produce 500,000 ounces. Uh, and again, these are very high grade ounces. So, you know, in our world today, um, you know, 2,500 grams per ton uh, silver would be, you know, absolutely fantastic. But if you think about 10% of that number, that's still pretty, pretty impressive in today's world. So, again, stay tuned and, and we will prove ourselves right. We will look at going through, if you look on uh, the bottom right of your slide, you'll see, um, you know, the shafts, the untested fault. That's where we're going to go to look very hard. Uh, you know, key exploration targets that have already been identified. And you have an access drift that uh, should lead us to these mineralized faults at the bottom of, of the little drawing that you see there. <clears throat> so the program going forward, this is what 2018 and 2019 looked like. And we're going to be a little different going into 2021, if you will. Uh, drilling at the Beaver Mine in 2018 did uncover multiple zones extending over two kilometers of near surface arsenic free. And I emphasize that silver and cobalt mineralization. Uh, grab samples that were taken around the nine historic mines on the property return up to 1500 grams per ton silver and 14.94% zinc. Again, very impressive numbers, but we have to determine continuity. We have to determine you know, that we can continue to get significant numbers. And again, if we take off that 1503 number and we make it 150 grams per ton, I think we would all be very pleased nevertheless. Uh, the high grade silver was found below the mine workings. And that's really where, if you will, this new thesis, thesis is gonna be focused on confirming the extension of uh, the mineralized structure below the mine and looking for numbers in keeping or within reason, the numbers that you see posted there. Um, as we go through the exploration program, <clears throat> and, and we've reviewed 2018 and 2019 in, in greater detail, um, you can see on, on the drawing that you see there, um, or the graphic that, you know, there are areas that really are asking to be looked at. And we understand on one side there could be overburden that we have to take into consideration. Certainly overburden adds to the cost of drilling, and we're aware of that. But I think the results and the rewards of dealing with it and getting rid, you know, going past the overburden and, and getting into the, you know, the historic footprint should lead us to some pretty good answers um, that we're seeking and in keeping with the, the new thesis of, if you will, pursuing uh, the silver veins, um, and maybe those that are even distinct from the original beaver vein um, that were also intersected and identified in 2018 and 2019. 
Um, again, a look at some of the core that you can see, some of significant numbers, um, you know, all extremely impressive in today's world. Um, and again, uh, these intersections are, you know, are, are presented as core length, but, you know, they're very, very attractive. Um, it, you know, if, if we can continue to hit similar numbers, even if they're lesser than that, but, you know, greater than, you, you know, than the 85 grams per ton that you see there, or, you know, maybe in the 120 range or 150 range, I don't think we'll have any problems pursuing this further. Um, so what else are we going to do? And, and I, I guess this is really kind of um, my greater interest um, beyond the exploration of Thunder Bay. I, I look at Thunder Bay, as I said, as a very interesting uh, project, one that we are, as I, and I'll repeat it, you know, going to focus on and deal with in earnest and in full. Um, but my relationship with Chad Williams and the reason I came on board at Honey Badger was also to look at building a presence for Honey Badger as a player in the silver space uh, by building, if you will, on my, on my relationships and networks uh, in the Americas. Both Chad and I have worked um, in the Americas and, and know it extensively well. Um, and one other thing that is important, too, we, we have relationships that remain. I mean, some of mine endure, you know, 30 plus years, um, you know, I've established network that has a strong presence in Peru and Chile, certainly in Brazil. Some of you know me because of my days in Brazil. Um, Colombia, I've done extremely well with Greystar Resources when, I, when we turned that around in 2001 to 2003. And it became quite a successful asset. And, you know, the, the stock did extremely, extremely well. Um, you know, same thing on, on working firsthand on the ground. Um, you know, it allows you to understand the jurisdiction, allows you to deal with the legalities, the permitting process, communities, how to address and enter into different communities, what the proper etiquette and protocol is. And we understand all that. And we've also contributed to the development and growth of what I term to be world-class deposits, such as La Coipa and Paracatu and Crishas. Uh, you know, La Coipa and Paracatu currently uh, you know, Kinross has done very well by those. Um, you know, if you remember TVX Gold, Echo Bay merged to form the Kinross that Paul Rollinson currently runs. And some of the primary assets within today's Kinross are those that were TVXs. And I was a, you know, I was a very strong part of that, of TVX. Um, so we do have experience working with mid-tiers and senior producers and with joint venturing projects. We don't, you know, expect to undertake everything ourselves, but we can certainly look at joint venturing uh, with other companies. We have those kind of relationships that will allow us to entertain new properties and, and new ideas um, by, you know, leaning on some of our friends and some of the seniors and, and the mid-tier producers that, that we're currently in conversations with. And lastly, the language fluency is very important to me. I like going to meetings where I understand what the language is that's being spoken around me. I'm fluent in Spanish, fluent in Portuguese. Um, my, my Canadian is pretty good, I think. So if we stay within the Americas, uh, we can do fairly, fairly well. Um, so again, why why would you want to invest in HB? Um, well, I think uh, Thunder Bay we're gonna we're really gonna give this a very strong look, and we're gonna try and develop it as best as we can, and and prove that this silver district is still one of the premier silver di silver districts in the world. Now uh, we're gonna focus on build a presence in the Americas by leveraging our first class relationships and build on our experiences. And uh, lastly, um, I think we're a focus group. Um, that is determined to really create uh, share value maximization. And I know you hear that from a lot of companies, but in this case, um, our intent is really to be proven and, and we are up for the challenge. <laughs>